عرفت الهوى مد عرفت الهوى عرفت الهوى مد عرفت الهوى وأغلق قلبي على العلاق وأغلق قلبي على العلاق وقمت أناجك يا من ترى وقمت أناجي to ask whether is it okay or if someone comes to me and say that it's sensitive and it's not appropriate, uh, how do we respond to that? And Maulid, Kasida and also the Kupur. Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so, um, with respect to, um, we're going to answer in two ways. One way, a, 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 a rote, shafi'i uh, legal answer, and um, I don't limit uh, law to that school, but um, as an admission of ignorance, that's the only school that I'm particularly trained in. So yeah. it's the only school in which I answer, typically. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a deficiency on my part. I should expand uh, my knowledge of the other schools. Um, a basic uh, understanding of that is that um, to do what people call um, <coughs> on in or in commemoration of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, specifically on that day, um, that, that is a praiseworthy um, innovation. And um, scholars such as Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani and Al Imam al-Suyuti discuss this in depth. And you can refer to some of their discussion in uh, Sayyid Muhammad Alawi al Malik in Mekki's um, discussion of the Mawlid, and I believe that is translated. Um, and uh, they say that it is a praiseworthy uh, innovation because it, in its form didn't uh, specifically exist in the time of the Prophet وسلم, however, um, it falls beneath an, a foundation in the religion. And um, a great uh, late Shafi'i Ibn Hajr al-Haytami, rahimahullah, he um, defined a praiseworthy innovation as a type of good which uh, conforms to uh, the book or um, consensus or traditions of the Salaf. Um, that is a praiseworthy um, new thing. And something that is new that opposes that, then that is a blameworthy um, innovation. And that's, uh, you know, Imam al-Shafi'i, he died um, in the year 204. He's from the Salaf. That was his understanding. Um, that was uh, an understanding of the likes of uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu, excuse me, Umar radiallahu anhu in his saying, in, as uh, Bukhari mentioned about Taraweeh, Ni'mal bid'atu hi. What an excellent innovation it is. And he said literally innovation, meaning that types of good that conform to the foundations of the religion are praiseworthy. Um, and certainly studying the seer of the Prophet sallallahu uh, and being happy about him are good. So then Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he said, that um, the basis in the religion that he um, under uses as a means for understanding the praiseworthy nature of commemorating the Mawlid is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commemorated and condoned, he um, himself acted on it and also made iqrar of the action of the Yahud of commemorating um, Ashura when Musa ala Nabina alayhi salatu was salam was saved um, he fasted that, and that's commemorating a significant event in the life of a prophetic community. So he found that as a basis, as an asl in the religion, and from that understood that commemorating prophet, prophetic events is a prophetic sunnah, or is a praiseworthy practice, therefore um, commemorating our Prophet وسلم, is certainly a type of good that falls under a fundamental in the religion. That's a basic fiqhi answer. Um, as for uh, what we quote-unquote call mawlid, and I say quote unquote because like we, we do that, you know, any given day of the week or any given hour of the day or any given minute of the hour, be happy about Sayyidina Rasulullah, that's a wajib. And that is a prophetic sunnah when done in verse. So um, 
Al-Hakim and uh, Al-Tabarani narrate um, with a chain uh, that was not a people that would fabricate and Al-Dahabi agreed with that and we've heard our shiuch say its Senate is Hassan that when they were returning from the battle of Tabuk Abbas Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu he said to the Prophet uh, O Messenger of Allah I want to praise you Uridu an amtadi haka and the Prophet Sallallahu um, not only condoned it without expression, but he told him to do so. So he said, Qul la yahdudillahu faqa. Speak and may Allah uh, preserve your teeth. And he lived to a very old age uh, from that dua without losing any teeth. So then he recited seven lines of poetry. Again, this is in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With his, not only approval, with his command. Um, and those seven lines are essentially what any of us uh, recite in one of our daily or weekly or yearly uh, readings of a uh, prophetic poem. Um, so he said, مِنْ قَبْلِهَا طِبْتَ فِي الْدِلَالِ وَفِي مُسْتَوْدَعٍ حَيْثُ يُخْصَفُ الْوَرَقُ ثُمَّ حَبَطَّ الْبِلَادَ لَا بَشَرًا أَنْتَ وَلَا مُبْغَةٌ وَلَا عَلَقُ بَلْ نُطْقَةٌ تَرْكَ بِالسَّفِينَةِ وَقَدْ أَلْجَمَ نَصْرًا وَأَحْلَهُ الْغَرَقُ تُنَقَّلُ مِنْ صَالِبٍ إِلَى رَحِمٍ إِذَا مَضَى عَالَمٌ بَدَ تَبَقُ وَأَنْتَ لَمَّا وُلِدْتَ حَتَّحْتَ وَابَيْتِكَ الْمُحَيْمَنُ مِنْ خِنْدِفِي عَلْيَاءَ تَحْتَهَا النُّطُقُ وَأَنْتَ لَمَّا وُلِدْتَ أَشْرَقَتِ الْأَرْضُ وَضَاءَتْ بِنُورِكَ الْأُفُقُ فَنَحْنُ فِي ذَلِكَ الْضِيَاءِ وَفِي النُّورِ وَصِبْلَ الرَّشَادِ نَخْتَرِقُ So he said, you were pure prior to this world and in the shadows where the fig leaves were worn, meaning when the Prophet was in the loins of Adam, right, and in the unseen. Then you descended to the earth, um, not a uh, not as a zygote or like a lump of flesh, but rather as a seed. You rode the ark when uh, Noah's people and the idol they worshipped, um, Nasser, was were all silenced by drowning. So he's mentioning things that are mentioned in those poems about the prophet, the prophet in the unseen, the prophet in the loins of prophets, the prophet passing on, um, and you were transmitted from a pure loins to a pure womb when one age passed, the other uh, came until your lineage was like a summit among mountains. Um, from uh, Khindif was the, the, his great-grandmother, the wife of Ilyas, great-great-great-great-grandmother, the wife of Ilyas. And then in these last two lines, he said, when you were born, he said it, the birth of the Prophet said, when you were born, the horizons uh, were illuminated, and uh, or the earth was illuminated, and the horizon shone with your light. He mentioned the birth, and he mentioned the light of the Prophet And he said, and we are traveling in that light and radiance on the pathways of guidance. So. To me, to recite a poem about that, it's a sunnah. Um, that's what we took from our shayukh. If you do it on, for instance, the 12th of Rabi'ah al-Awwal, then we could say it's bid'ah hasana. Otherwise, praise of the Prophet said them in verse is a clear prophetic sunnah. Um, Abbas did it in this hadith. Hassan bin Dabit does it in numerous uh, sahih hadith. Uh, Ibn Rawaha does it. Um, and that was something that was commonly practiced in the presence of the Prophet said, in his masjid. Um, and that's clearly established by religion. Um, but if someone doesn't want to do that, or doesn't want to call it maulid, fadlah. You know, like where we live, there's people with a narrow understanding. So we get together and read the seer of the Prophet, and do salawat on the Prophet on a weekly basis, and we don't call it a maulid. And what's that? Yeah. Uh, our, sh our shaykh on Facebook, he says, uh, the weekly reading of the prophetic seerah. And that's what you're doing, studying the seerah in verse. Um, so that's one. What was the second one you asked me? Qasida, khalas. There's Qasida, that's Milyan. So look at the, uh, there's the Dawaween for the Sahaba. There's, there's <coughs> compilations of poetry of the Sahaba. Look at Zayd, uh, 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 look at Hassan bin Dabit specifically. And the Prophet said that the, 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 the Holy Spirit, meaning Gabriel, continues, continues to, uh, def, uh, to aid um, uh, Hassan as long as, uh, as long as he defends the Messenger of Allah. Um, that's in poetry. What's the other? Bukhur. You don't like to smell good? Yeah. Then why? I mean, what's... Yeah, is it permissible to burn things? Yes, it's permissible to burn things. So if someone burns something permissible and it smells nice, yeah, what kind of shaitan wouldn't like that? <laughs> Honestly speaking, yeah. That's the shaitan. Yeah. Shayateen don't like good smells. Angels like good smells. And our prophets always said them, good smells are just such a clear prophetic sunnah, I can't believe we talk about it. To be quite honest, yeah. Yeah, of one. The yeah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would use Bukhur uh, before Qiyam al uh, And uh, there's Athar indicating that there will be Mabakhir min Uluwa 
that there will be uh, things for burning bukhur from uh, aloes wood, like brood, um, in paradise. But I mean, yani, fragrance is just hubbiba uh, ilayya min dunyakum and nisa'awati, hadith is sahih. Two things have been made beloved from your world, not his world, um, uh, ladies, and uh, fragrance. Wujurilat kuru tu aini fi salah. And my utmost joy is in salah. So if someone said that to me, I'd say, Yalla, brother, are we um, in the sunnah of our utmost joy being salah? And if not, why do we have time to argue about um, another thing that is beloved to Prophet Muhammad rather than dealing with fundamentals? Yeah, because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, because in our country sometimes it's a bit uh, sensitive because uh, this kind of smoke and all sometimes being related to witchery and, uh, and that's how you animate it from the TVs and all. So, yeah, it's my bad to watch it. So, uh, how did they cook before there was gas stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Prophet says, and Aisha said, the Prophet would go a month and a two month and there'd be no fire in his home. What does that mean? Other months they would cook with fire in their home and burn things in the street. What it is is that some people just have a sensitivity to anything of this. When I became Muslim in 1996, uh, that I used to like candles. And I was around some of these types of people that are just like, they just get worried about anything. Anything that, beautiful? Yeah, like, and like one time I just had candles lit and I had one of these people over and he was very uncomfortable. Right, the fact that I had lit candles and that he essentially was trying to tell me this is like too, like, this is too weird and spiritual, like we can't do this as Muslims, like it was candles. <laughs> like, so the point is, is that like, people just unfortunately are, you know, just hypersensitive to these types of things when they clearly have, you know, either a basis in permissibility or a shake of it. I mean, you can, you can say that, I mean, you know, polytheists pray, so should we just run away from prayer? Right? So, I know what you're saying, that because they say, well, you know, Hindus burn this. Well, it's just illogical to make those connections like that. Chef, yeah, into candles, that's the soft side. Can I have any questions from the floor? Before I ask another provocative question again? Oh, okay. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is actually for um, all the scholars. Um, I'm a university student, and just now from the uh, discourses from the scholars, um, uh, most um, there were some topics that were touched about students in university having a degree and so on. So I'm from Singapore. So the problems uh, that is currently facing faced by Singapore students is um, our professors usually will ask when we write reports, citations, where's your citations, where's your reference. So this kind of um, behavior has been brought into how people study the team. So they want to know where's your daily, where's your daily, where's your daily. So they've been, we are asking each other this uh, often. And uh, for for those in the hard sciences, they will ask for empirical evidence. So they, they are used to asking evidence when studying religion. And those studying the humanities and the arts, they have reduced um, God to just merely a concept. So this is the uh, two ends. And for those who are always asking for Dalil, uh, they ha what is the uh, what's observed is usually they will tend to shift towards sal Salafism and away from Al Sunnah wa Jamaah. And uh, they are very, they are actually very few in number, but increasing in influence because of their charisma and and so on. When when pushing forward this, and uh, is actually threatening the uh, tradition of al Sunnah wal Jamaah in the universities. And uh, some of the traditional teachers in Singapore, they are quite concerned because um, it is expected that these students in universities they will go up to be leaders in the corporate world or societies, and this might an impact on the tradition of al Sunnah wal Jamaah in our society in the long run. So if, um, my question is, uh, how can we, from um, the al Sunnah wal Jamaah, in this region especially, help to reduce this problem in the universities? Uh, 
Svetlana. It's a very good question, and I'll do my best. There's several things I'd like to get out. Hopefully, it'll be somewhat coherent. Um, I think, in general, that our time in which we live in the age of information requires that we bump up the um, expected level of knowledge to a level that we become really functional. We have a concept in Islam as of a farda ayn knowledge, individual obligations. And generally speaking, that, that pertains to what we need to know of the basics of creed, practice, and spirituality. But I think that you could put forth an argument that part of farda ayn, individual obligation knowledge, is that it's that which you need to know that to correctly that maintain your religious life, okay? And so meaning that, that if you need to bump up a level of knowledge in order to have a correct perspective to see things clearly in a given circumstance, that you could say that this is becomes an individual obligation. Essentially what I'm saying is that with the explosion of information and people entering into universities and being exposed to so many different things, that we have to bump up the level of our own knowledge. And that a Sunday school type level of knowledge, meaning a very basic level of knowledge, oftentimes is not sufficient. And to the degree that we're exposed to various other types of knowledge is to the degree that we need to that you know uh, expand our own um, our own knowledge base. And so that that as for Dalil, that in proofs for what we say, that this is actually a good thing that the people of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jamaa that focus on proofs. Proofs are a very good thing. Otherwise, that anyone could say whatever it is that they want to say. So proofs are of a good thing, and proofs are of different types. And if I may, by way of, it's not a joke, but we could laugh at it. Um, it also requires, though, that people actually know what a proof is. So there was a famous story of the Imam al marhum Shaheed Sheikh al that uh, he was giving a lecture, and during his lecture he quoted a hadith, and someone stands up in the crowd, and said that, you know, what's the synod? What's the chain of narrators of that hadith? And so Sheikh Abuti says, so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. He mentions like four or five names. And the imam says, Jazakallah khair, thanks, and he sits down. And Sheikh Abuti says, you've just witnessed utter, like, stupidity. I named him my tailor, my butcher, and just five people that, like, no one knew. Right? Or that he knew that no one would be anything. And so the person thought, Oh, thank you. I've got my proof now, and he sat down, which shows the sheer. We have to know what a proof is, right? Or what type of proof are we talking about, right? Is it a a a that did it shari, right? Is it is it is it is it, is it, is it a sharia proof, or is it a dalil akli? Is it a rational proof, or is it a experimental proof? There's different levels of judgments, and this is a part of our educational process of learning of that. And so that, that I, I do think that we need to be very creative moving forward and that developing programs and ways for thinking people to get the foundations that they need to process that the way that they view the world. There's no other way around it than that. That's simply the only way to do it. But I will say just one last point is that, um, that you made the division between the hard sciences and the humanities and I think to some degree that's true. But that when we talk about taqlid, which is accepting qualified scholarship or just acceptance, sometimes it's, I don't like this translation of it, termed blind following, is that academia, and I'm in it, is filled with blind following, right? especially in the humanities, is, is that someone does research and they write a book, and that someone else comes along and uses their book as a reference without checking the results of their research. And then someone else comes along and uses that, but it's filled with taqlid. In other words, that people are authorities and people listen to what they have to say. And this is why you'll have that someone comes 75 years later and changes, they become famous because they changed the whole nature of the discourse because they, they actually went back and found that there was a translation mistake in the first book or that there was something he didn't consider so he had to modify his theory and so forth. And this is the nature of academia and to some degree that as well with the hard sciences because that how many of us actually go back to check right, the control of this particular experiment and that to replicate it as well, that oftentimes it's accepted and that without us 
you know, so this is not this is a this is a this is a problem that relates to knowledge, and and that that we have to have sophisticated ways that, that we deal with uh, all of this. But um, that's what comes to mind for that. I don't know if anyone wants to add something. Um, you know, uh, I entirely agree with what Sheikh Yahya was saying. That is, it's excellent that we discuss the real. And those of you that are um, you know rigorous in your study, um, learn Arabic and learn how to uh, read the books of law, for instance, much of their discourse is about law, those who incline towards uh, asking people about the Leo. You know, read the Majmu'ah of Imam al Nawi or Himahullah, it's full of Adilah. And not just that, the proper understanding of, how to, um, of what Adilah is and how it's applied um, to uh, you know, secondary questions in the law. Um, but then also, you know, like if we're learning about uh, citation in academic institutions, my question is, what is there to deal for their institution? Like, honestly, um, if I were to ask Sheikh Yahya, what is his uh, citation? I mean, I know a little bit of it, but he knows it better than I do. He's going to say, uh, someone named Muhammad, uh, Habib Omar bin Muhammad bin Salam, cites for me. He, he licenses my knowledge. And he was licensed, for instance, by his father, uh, Habib Muhammad bin Salam who was licensed by his grandfather, uh, Habib Salam bin Hafid, who was licensed by the ulama, a, a generation of scholars, among them, Habib Abdul Rahman Mashfur. And Sheikh Yahya could quote those names back to their grandfather, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi 40-some names. He has a citation back to the one who received the revelation, and that's from our religion, and that's something we taught them. You know, this is from our Khazayas, and we have it much stronger than they do. Where's their senate, for instance, in physics to Isaac Newton? And how do the people who learn that, that are substantiating this university, how do we know that they had an aptitude? Sheikh Yahya could show you that in what he's talking about. Many of them in their institutions can. One of our ulama, they came and said, you need a shahada. said, man yashhed li. You, you need one of these people's testimony, which is how we uh, say diploma. He said, who in the world is going to testify for me? I know what my shiuk is. And uh, yeah, so, you know, um, be careful what you take from what you take. That's such a, a beautiful point that he said, is that, that you, even with Western philosophy, that there is no Senate. There is that what the way that philosophy books are studied is that, that the text is presented and everyone has, I've seen it literally in the classroom, everyone just offers their own understanding. There is no, you know, schools do develop and so forth, but th there's not an idea of Senate. It's just really kind of, oh, what, you know, and this is the part of the postmodern world, everything's relative. It's seeped into even critical theory and literature and so forth, where that it's just about whatever, whatever you interpret the text. And then the part of critical theory is that, that, oh, there is no one meaning to the text. The meaning is the meaning that it's given by the onlooker. So you could, in just totally absurd and ridiculous things from a grounded religious perspective, interpret from a text that's not there. It's in your mind, but there's philosophies that say, oh, but that is actually the meaning of the text because you made it. So, so uh, the point is that he, it's totally accurate what he's saying, and it, it becomes completely chaotic and, and as a result. The transmissional change for, change, for example, even what, say, for example, someone like Charles Darwin says is, you know, uh, much of this is misquoted. But I just wanted to make a point that if you look at the context of your question and, and, and the concerns that you have about the university students, for example, but more about people who ask for Dalil, one is, yes, that there are people who are trained in the secular education and therefore they seek to you know, find ways to, in fact, have evidences and proofs provided. And I understand that. And as Sheikh Yahya has mentioned, that, you know, we, we need to develop more of the discourse as far as that is concerned. But most of that, in fact, doesn't come from there. It comes from a, 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 a more sinister objective, and I think that needs to be mentioned, and that is to actually uh, create confusion in order to uh, uh, push a particular kind of an objective, because one way to really derail an, a, a, a discussion is to actually do that, and that's the, that's the unfortunate problem in that regard. There's a time and place for proofs, because when we are at university, if we're going to use the example from your context, we don't sit around talking about evidences, per se, or proofs. There is a, a level of trust, for example, and as Sheikh Abdul Karim Yahya said, that that, in fact, chain is well cited, and the trust abilities actually are built in there, and therefore, if one, we have to first understand what proofs are, 
Therefore, you don't necessarily sit down and discuss it anymore. There's a time and place for that. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, I think Sheikh Yahya mentioned uh, briefly, is that the, uh, the, there are different levels of different kinds of proofs. And a quick example of that is the, the current mathematics no longer is proof for quantum mathematics. No longer. Uh, at, the, at the computational level, the current algorithmic mathematics is no longer applicable. There are many, many black holes that we do not know how, in fact, certain computational functions actually function. We don't know that. So, uh, there are different levels of, 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 of proofs. It is not only uh, uh, sapiential empirics. It's, there's, there's more than that uh, in, in, in relation to different levels of proofs. And finally, uh, uh, I think the, the important element of this entire discussion is, is going back to uh, uh, getting the foundations right. A lot of the discussion that actually goes around about proof is because the foundations of the deen is not understood. And therefore, the questioning of evidences are often actually a secular understanding by which the, those questions come about. It is not actually grounded in the traditional basis of, of asking those questions, right? So it's going back to those foundations which are in fact are quite important because once they are established, Fard al Kifaya, Fard al etc., are actually established, that we actually have taken from the cited works of the classical uh, teachers all the way connected to the Prophet, وسلم, the authors of the books, etc., then, then the question of, the question of, of references or, or evidences don't actually come about because you have already dealt with that. And often that is the basis of what in fact is often discussed in, in lectures and presentations because this is not, uh, uh, when you talk about seminars and workshops, etc., they are not necessarily built to, to, to prove something. It's about to, in fact, expound on the knowledge that, in fact, has come through those transmissional chains. Wow.